All right. Hello. Welcome, everybody. This is Julie from the CTL, um, the Center for Teaching and Learning at Cincinnati State Technical and Community College. And we are going to be working um, through teaching in the time of COVID, specifically what's it like to learn during a pandemic. And I do have some participants with me and others may be joining us in as we get started. So welcome to all of you. I want to jump right in and I am sharing my screen. So hopefully you can see what I can see and give me a thumbs up if you do. Basically, before we do anything for any workshop, I want to make sure that we frame ourselves really well. So we are not going to go too far out of this frame when we're thinking because we want to work with intention, especially during times like now when there's crisis going on, social change and revolution, we're in an election year. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty that's happening. So our frame for this is going to be your school's mission. So for example, Cincinnati State's mission states that we want to provide access and opportunity and support for our students to achieve success in seeking through or applying in, in the context of exceptional um, technical transfer, experiential and cooperative education that includes for us workforce. Now that mission is really the same for everyone, no matter how your institution has it written, we want our students to be successful, period. We want to do our jobs in such a way that our students are able to take what we've given them, use and apply in context and elevate themselves, level up, if you will. So that's nothing new. But what I want you to do is in part one of your worksheet, and this is the worksheet that you received by email, part 1A, it says, four words there, mission, vision, values, and rewrite. Now the rewrite part of this, and I'm just gonna go back a slide real quick. That, that R word could be so many things. It could be refine, rewrite, reevaluate. It could just be evaluate. It doesn't have to be an R word, but what it should encompass is this idea of fluidity, that we recognize that we are in a period of serious change and that things are going to happen. And I'm gonna take and collect data about what I'm doing, the solutions I've embarked upon, and I'm going to apply that in a fluid living way to my work. And I'm gonna to continue to constantly revise that with informed data. So it's gonna be like an informed revision. So that last word rewrite, it really is whatever word you, works best for you. But right now I'm gonna give you seven minutes. And what I want you to do is take mission mission, mission, vision, values, and whatever that other word for you is. And I want you to either draw, write, build, somehow in this space provided to you on the worksheet, connect these words together in whatever way makes sense to you. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about that. So I've got seven minutes on the clock right now, and I'll give you a two minute warning.
Okay, that's a two minute warning. All right, one minute. All right, we're back. So what I've been hearing about this part, and one of the things I like about asking people to think first creatively, is that the way you individually are gonna put these words together is very unique to you. So I've heard things like concentric circles, almost like a Venn diagram that the mission, um, the vision and the values are all uh, linked and then all around it is this whatever your R word is, for fluidity that we're constantly uh, changing or addressing. I've also heard people put it in a sort of an outline form where your mission is your overreaching goal, your vision is how you're going to achieve that goal, and your values are, am I aligned with the values, both my own, my institution, my pedagogy, my philosophy of teaching, are these things aligned? And then lastly, how am I gonna um, use feedback and data to change that? So if we wanted to extend this frame, one B of your worksheet then would be to take a single challenge and with that challenge, apply these things to it. So we're gonna do this together. And basically, if we chose one challenge, in this case, let's say it's um, that we want to deal with the social distancing um, reduction that we're gonna have with our students. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about that one in particular but you're gonna lose your proximity classroom management. You're gonna lose a little bit of your ability to be passionate and animated in the classroom. Um, you know, obviously we lose some of our traditional cooperative learning with group work and some other things that you might already rely on as active engagement in your classroom for students. But with this said, if I think about what is my goal, what, what do I wanna do? My goal is I want students to feel safe and comfortable and I wanna get through this objective. And I want to do it in a way where students are actively engaged or that they have outs that they can use to to get back to being engaged with what we're doing. We talked in workshop one a lot about what vision is and vision or being a visionary means that although I'm over here as an authoritative person, I'm creating the experience for the other people in the room. I'm not separate from them. A vision is all inclusive. It requires that I understand I'm part of this community. Now, my role may be different, but it also helps us to recognize that my behavior affects everyone in the room and everyone in the room's behavior affects me. <coughs> Pardon me. And so with that in mind, a vision is the context under which we accomplish our mission. And so if I sit and I think about what does it look like, it's easier for me to start troubleshooting how to make that um, a reality. My values, so my teaching philosophy, my pedagogy, my, you know, college, or in this case, my institution's uh, values, whatever it is, need to be met during that time. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what some of those pillars are for Cincinnati State in a moment as an example. And then I have to be willing to collect data when I'm trying these things out, when I'm making, when I'm acting on my vision, and then use that to revise things. You know, in workshop one, we also talked about the ability to recognize our imperfections, 
to know that we don't know it all is what's going to allow us to have connection with our students and others and that creates a vulnerability space of which allows us to have very genuine conversation and very original cohort building we are all in this together and so we can use that as a way to lift everyone up um, especially through their learning and increase our successes in this way so the other real benefit to thinking this way even if you're not doing it for just one challenge one objective or you're doing it for sets of objectives and i'm specifically here referring to if if someone in administration were to ask you how are you solving the problem of x and this challenge or problem comes from the fact that we're in a pandemic right now and all these other things are going on and anxieties are high and we have all these structural issues and i'm not even sure if everybody knows how they're even going to attempt to start to fix some of these things with that in mind if somebody were to ask me how did i manage the challenge of social distancing well it's very easy for me to answer that because i said well here was my goal this was my vision these are parts of the vision that worked and these are parts that didn't work and throughout this entire thing i made sure that i was maintaining my values and the values of the institution while i was doing this work so it's a way for you to report back data to superiors and institutional reporting that we do like higher learning commission or departments of ed um, and it, you've thought about it in this way from the beginning with this frame so it becomes easier for you to do these kinds of reports without adding additional stress onto yourself often we are asked as educators to report back on what we've been doing multiple times and often sometimes with redundancy <laughs> And in, well, please put it in this format or that format. And one of the things I like about this framing things this way with this mission, vision, values, and whatever you want to put down as that fourth word does allow you to very easily extrapolate the data out into whatever format an administrator is asking you to provide and without adding too much additional work on you. So planning is a good thing. So for Cincinnati State Technical and Community College, these are our proposed four pillars. And I would challenge anyone, if you actually did that last um, part 1A and part B, I would challenge you by simply saying, I guarantee there's no way that you didn't have a thought in your mind that fell under one, if not all of these categories. So when we are intentionally building things with these words in mind, mission, vision, values, and whatever that other fourth word for you is, we're thinking about our students achieving academic excellence. We're thinking about enriching our student experience despite some pretty significant barriers at this time. And we know those barriers exist in our population anyway. Cincinnati State Technical and Community College is one of the diver most diverse community colleges in the state of Ohio. We also have one of the largest international populations. So we have a large group of marginalized individuals and we have our average age of students 28 which means they have life challenges on top of other things we obviously we're engaging our community because no matter how we're interacting with our students whether that's live web with zoom or whether that's in the classroom with all of these other uh, parameters in place we're still engaging them and then obviously we're strengthening our future because we're moving forward we're still teaching no matter how we're doing it we're still actively engaging our students all right so hopefully if you give me a thumbs up if that makes any sense we can move on from there so our two objectives that we're going to talk about for this part of the workshop is to discuss and learn about stressors and some of the new challenges that we're facing during specifically during a pandemic and as a biologist i'm going to talk a little bit about the biology behind the science behind why i believe some of our tactics and strategies that we're going to talk about can work so those are our two objectives is to discuss and then to explore some strategies so um and i really get excited about this part because i don't get to do a lot of biology straight biology teaching with the ctl but fear <laughs> and uncertainty are what lead to anxiety so anxiety is contagious human emotion and I even struggle to call it emotion. I, I almost want to say it's, I would call it more of a condition. So um, let's talk about that. So it's actually called a social contagion um, in some circles. And so um, we, can, we can chat about how we get here. Fear is a rewarded emotion. So, you know, I see a tiger, I run from the tiger, I survive, I have babies, I'm biologically successful. And so our bodies, our brains 
actually reward us for fear. So we get rewarded uh, when we're fearful, which is an interesting thing, right? Because it keeps us alive. And then also, if you think about uncertainty, which I'm unsure about what's going on, right? Um, that can drive my fear. And these, these two things work together to create what we call anxiety. Now, this is a simplistic um, explanation, but when I have fear plus uncertainty, it leads to anxiety. This also helps us understand that anxiety is not a single emotion, which is why I said it's more likely conditional, if you want to think of it this way. And part of that reason is because not everybody has the same threshold for fear. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story. It's a real story. I'm not extrapolating or embellishing this at all. I was in um, Oaxaca, Mexico for an animal behavior meeting. And while I was there, we were having the talks were in this very old building that had a one floor that was below the ground floor. And you know, in a conference, in general, there's an area where everybody congregates and you have coffee and you talk and then you break out into these individual sessions to hear people talk or give their papers. Well, I was really, really excited about um, this trip, not only because it was in Oaxaca, Mexico, which is beautiful, but also because there was a lot of speakers I really wanted to hear. And I was getting ready to enter into grad school for the second time. So my advisors and my, my fellow peer graduate students were there. So I'm listening to this talk about crickets and um, I'm, you know, remember very clearly having an issue with some of her data. So I was really involved in listening because she was talking about male courtship and the frequency of this. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, correlation need not indicate causation. And I was going through this big thing. And that tells you how, how much I remember this down to that level of detail. All of a sudden, at some point, I noticed that the people who worked at this hotel were kind of exiting, all of them were exiting the building. Like they were just all leaving us. Um, and I thought that that was a little bit strange. And I sat with me, my gut went off. I was maybe 10 or 20 seconds after I realized there was no workers there that I actually left the building myself. So my fear threshold is pretty low. <laughs> well, it turns out I get outside I don't speak Spanish and quite a few of, we didn't have a, a similar language at that point, but we're talking about it and I'm trying to get from them, why did they, why are they all standing outside? There was no sound, no fire drill, nothing. Um, turns out we were in the middle of an earthquake, a pretty big one actually. And this was a very old building. And so their standard was if they get that, you know, whatever the, they're in tune to, um, they take off. So they didn't alert anybody because that's not their, uh, their protocol or whatever. So I'm out there, my advisor came out a few minutes later, I was like, okay, I'm in the right lab. But people were down there for a long time, never never came out. And I kept thinking to myself, wow, you know, I, I paid attention, I was observant to what was going on around me and I wasn't gonna stay in that space. And then you have people who, there's an F3 tornado coming down their road and they're standing on the porch watching it, right? So we have thresholds of fear. We also have thresholds of uncertainty. And so by adding these two variables together, which equals this condition of anxiety, you never really know where somebody is. Because, you know, if they're like me, a very, very cautious risk taker, then that's one thing. It doesn't take much fear and uncertainty to get me to a place where I feel anxious. Where somebody else might take them longer. So that's something I want to like keep in mind as, as we're thinking through all of this. The other thing that I think is interesting is that we all have examples of how anxiety is contagious. I'm going to give you one teaching example, and certainly you can think of your own. So walking down the hall, there's a group of students outside of a classroom getting ready to go in and take a test. Let's say there's a student coming from their locker or from the garage into the hallway, and they feel really good. Like it's the start of their day, let's say, and they've studied really hard. But as they encounter the other students, as they're walking up outside of the room, they're seeing people like flip through their textbook and people are talking very fast and somebody's asking questions and you're hearing things like, well, do you think that'll be on the test? Because I didn't study that because I didn't think that she said we had to do that thing. And I don't, you know, and so you get it, right? There's all this amped up and we've all seen it and it's anxiety. But the person who was super calm walking in to the classroom or at least as much as calm as you can be going into a test, feeling confident, all of a sudden starts to feel unsure. And then I start to be fearful. Well, what if I didn't study the right stuff? Well, what if they're right? And this is gonna be on the test. I don't remember that being said, but maybe it is. Now I'm flipping through my book, right? 
my anxiety has gone up here and I have everybody in a group now feeling more anxious. There's a couple of natural reasons why this occurs. If one person is very anxious, they don't want to be an outsider. So what they're going to do, often subconsciously, it's not maliciously intended, is I'm going to bring you over to my camp. I'm going to say to you, I'm anxious. And by the way, this is why I'm anxious. And I'm going to start talking to you, inventing to you about the rabbit hole of studying I went down the night before and how I wonder if the, you know, this tiny figure that was found on the last page of something is something that they're going to test me. And I'm unsure about my professor. So I'm going to assume that they're going to ask me really obscure things and, you know, I, I, things that aren't with my objectives or that you said one time in passing, you know, so I don't want to be alone in feeling that way. And so I'm going to infect the space between us with all of these anxious things. And even if you are the most mindful, calm person, it's really hard to stay that way around a group of people that are feeling really anxious. Okay, so thumbs up to me if that makes sense or you've experienced anything like that before. And while you're thinking about that and give me your reactions, let me just, oh, I'm sure you have, Colleen, especially with special ed, yeah. So mindfulness is one cure. And there's many, but mindfulness is a really good one. And a holistic paradigm is absolutely the best way to combat this. So what we're really doing is all of this stuff that's going on around us, we're kind of retreating into ourselves with some direction and we are being forced to remove some of these other variables around us and just to focus in on one thing. And even for a short period of time, it has tremendous benefit. So Judd Brewer down here at the bottom and the PowerPoint is filled with all these links that are live. This comes from um, one of his works called Anxiety is Contagious and here's how to contain it. And this is a person who spent their life's work trying to combat anxiety along with other things. So this is a scenario. Sometime in your class, you're seeing signs of stress in your students. Now it's best if we're observant and we're trying to scan our room pretty regularly so that we can look for these things kind of as they occur. It's much easier to do these techniques when you catch it in the beginning versus when an entire cohort has gotten anxious um, or more anxious. But the minute that you see any of the, those anxiety and stress behaviors, which we talked about in workshop one, so you can go back and, and look at that. We'll, we'll talk about a few in a minute too. You got to run interference. That's the best thing to do is just to run interference. And it's worth in your mission, vision, values, and your rewrite, it's worth planning these things in from the beginning. So say I'm going to have in my bank of time, I have in my mind, I always have a bank of time. I'm going to have five to seven minutes where if I wanted to run a code or get in touch with my calm or do one of these activities, it's going to be built into my lesson plan because I want to be able to do that whenever I need to. In the beginning, when you do these things, it might take you as many as two to five minutes to implement them with directions. But after students and people get used to it, all you have to do is give the code. Let's run a code or trigger word. Hey, let's get in touch with our calm and they're gonna know what to do. So I'm gonna have you do something for me. And Colleen, I am gonna ask you to turn on your video for just one very small thing in just a moment. Um, so running a code has a medical background to it. And so if I'm a medical professional and someone down the hall is coding, I'm gonna to run to that code. I don't know what I'm getting into, but the minute I get there, I have to assess what's happening before I can act. So it comes from the same idea is that it's a 10 second or so practice. I'm going to run a code on myself. I'm going to take a moment of pause and I'm going to literally check in the inventory physically with myself. Now there's lots of ways you can direct students to do this. Pulse, breathing, just asking them to check their data. Am I hungry? Do I need a break? Do I feel like I have to go to the bathroom? You know, do I need to go to my cozy corner? You know, what do I need to do <laughs> to get myself to a place where I can check check in with myself. Once we've done this inventory thing, and you don't want to do all the things, but just say, hey, check in with yourself and ask yourself, how are you doing right now? And then give them some direction on, on what to do. There's a couple things we want to do then to break that. So I want you, if you have a cell phone, I want you to go to your cell phone. I want you to go to Google. I want you to type in baby animals. Hit search. 
click images, and then I want you to pick one, pick one and show it to me on your screen. And I'm gonna do the same thing. Okay, I'm doing this one. <laughs> so when you're ready, are you okay with that? Can you give me a thumbs up? All right, great. When you pick your animal, show it to me. I'll show you mine. What you got there? What's your baby animal? You can just hold it right up for me. I can't see what I'm showing. I just see you right now. What I do is I actually just put my phone in front of my camera. Oh, you got a baby deer. Oh, I picked I picked Fiona. Fiona's real famous here in Cincinnati. She's a <laughs> she's a hippo that was born prematurely. Oh, thank you, Colleen. Yeah. Yeah, so what's happening, and you can turn your video off now if you want, but what's happening to us, right? We are smiling. I feel better. We are naturally conditioned to look at baby things and want to protect them um, in general. And so when I look at baby things, baby animals, even baby humans, whatever it is, as a human being, my normal reaction to that is to release some oxytocin. Oxytocin is a chemical, the love drug, that actually helps me then to combat cortisol in this moment. It's ephemeral, it's a short-term fix, but you will notice that the entire condition of your classroom completely changes. And this is where we help to train students that they are in control of their internal condition. If at any point they need to look at baby animals, they can look at baby animals. So that's one example. A few other things you can do is guide people through a happy memory or to go to a happy place. You know, this idea of going to your happy place is, is really actually very important. I will tell you, my mother had emergency heart surgery and I had to walk her through some pretty hard things and taking her to a place where we could sit on the beach and just visualizing with her was very helpful in her healing and helped to get her off a ventilator. So, you know, there's power in this, um, in using our mind in this way. This is a little different than getting in touch with your calm. So running a code is running interference on my emotional condition and changing perhaps where I'm at. And this could be, I've got a room full of a few students that are angry or I'm seeing the anxious anxiety go up or whatever the case is, it doesn't matter. And everybody can join in at the same time. Once you do this once or twice, it becomes really fast because people want to do it. You say, you know what, everybody, I think I need to, let's run a code. I feel like I need to run a code, right? And do that. I sometimes will stop in the middle of my lecture if I realize I'm, get, I'm getting a little snarky and I'll say, you know what? I need to, I need to look at my baby animals. I, I think I'm a little agitated today. It's not you, you know? And that way it gives everyone permission to do it. Getting in touch with our calm is gonna be something super physical that we're gonna do. It's either breathing like a cleansing breath or a box breath. So the free calm app, um, it's free on your phone or on your computer. And you can download it and it'll give you a breathing bubble. I don't know if you've ever seen those, but a breathing bubble is something that will say, breathe in, hold, breathe out. And usually there's some really calming background with some noise like birds, crickets, water. Works really well. One thing I'll mention is you can't assume that everybody has the ability to have a cell phone or a smartphone or even the, the messaging rates that may apply for that. So if you're doing Zoom, you can share your screen and show it on the computer. Or if you're in the classroom physically, you can project it on the back. You can even make your own breathing bubble, which is just basically a circle with three varying colors on it and you physically point at it and move it around. So down here is a link to lots of different types of breathing and a different article, which uh, takes you right to that breathing bubble and calm. There's another app called Shine, which I really like. It'll send you affirmations, ask you how you're feeling. It's a really, really awesome app that's also free. All of these do have premium versions, but the free ones work just fine. So why are we bothering to address any of this stuff? Well, I know, and I said in workshop one for everybody, you're content experts. I'm not concerned about your ability to teach your discipline but I am wanting to make sure that you have a toolbox on how to manage some of these other things that we're dealing with right now. 
So during times of crisis, students may have these things and we might also be a little faster to conflict. Our minds are gonna wander. They're gonna wander for longer periods of time and more frequently. There's gonna be a reduction of listening, less patience all around. We're gonna lose perspective. So it's gonna be a constant bringing us, framing us back in, reframing back in. And there's a difficulty focusing. We also wanna commiserate with others. And we want everybody to be on our level so that I can feel more normalized with my uncertainty and fear. All of these things can reduce stress or success. So the higher the stress level and anxiety, the reduction in success. Lower the stress and anxiety level and we increase um, success probabilities. So it's, it's in our best interest to provide safe environments for students that are stress reducing so that they can increase their success. So there's a direct relationship there. This link on the top right hand side that I have is uh, just the CDC guidelines for how to cope with stress. It's a pretty bulleted list, so it's important. The second one is um, there specifically for, for us. And this is a Nature article. Nature is one of the top two journals, scientific journals in the world. And they're talking about how we handle our stress during a pandemic. And I think that that's an important piece to keep in mind. All right, so I have another activity I'd like to do, and I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment. So on your workshop in 2A, I'm going to ask you to do something with me first. And so Colleen, have your uh, thumbs up ready. Think of something that you like to do creatively. For me, I like to oil paint. I'm not saying I'm good at it, but it makes me feel really good to do it. And so I like to paint. Um, what is it that you like to do? Think about that. Could be writing, could be gardening, could be um, crafting, sewing. There's so many things. And if you want to send me in chat what yours is, that I, I can direct it a little bit better. What I want you to do now for me is I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine doing that thing that you like to do, that creative thing. Start thinking about your materials, you know, how does it smell? What does it feel like to touch these things? And then I want you to breathe into that with me a little bit. And then I want you to take it a little step further. Like for me, I'm painting a picture and I'm thinking about what's that going to be? What colors am I going to use? I'm envisioning my canvas now. Okay, and then I want you to breathe into it even further and think about what does this look like when it's like 25% complete? All right, and let's breathe into that a little bit further. What does it look like when it's halfway complete? How are you feeling now? You know, do you, I have paint on my hands probably. That makes me happy. Okay. Now I want you to quietly open your eyes. Now, what this does is it puts you in a creative space. And that's where I want you to be because I want you to create your own mindfulness activity to combat anxiety in your classroom. And this is 2A. So I'm gonna give you a total of about five minutes on the clock to think about these ideas because I know that you'll have to refine these later. So I'm gonna put five minutes on the clock right now. Please complete 2A of your packet.
So that's a two minute warning. One minute. Okay, so I'll give you a few examples of um, some other ideas that came out of this process I thought were really good. Sarah Jane Blatt, who's a maternity nurse um, at, at Health and Public Safety at Cincinnati State, said that she does cleansing breath with her students. And so she and I are gonna do an interview about that and I'll post it up on the COVID-19 faculty resource site for all of you. But I've heard some other really creative things too. Um, I guess the only other direction I would give to you is this. If you're going to make it content related, so if it's going to be something that is related to what you're teaching or an objective that you're working toward, please make sure that every single person can be successful with this. Because as a mindfulness activity, it will lose its value if a person is unable to achieve it. Um, so it has to be the lowest level of achievement for people. You can build up to other things, but we have to start where every single person can be successful. All right. Okay, so at this point, I have two parts left remaining of our workshop. And um, so if you need to take a break, this is a really good time for you to take a human break. Um, before you do, these are some resources that are available to you in the workshop, uh, the PowerPoint that you get. All these links are live. I have a CCP connection here, which is a high school um, connection to how they're dealing with this time during the viral load. If you're taking college courses while still in high school that we can deal with this pandemic that's happening. And then also we have a large international population. So this is a little bit of data about how some international populations specifically are working with this. So I'm gonna take a, a five minute break now. Um, so you should do the same and then I will come back uh, for part two.